All right. Um, welcome, everybody, to our uh, Money in Politics session. Uh, my name is Logan. I am the community organizer at uh, Maine Women's Lobby Education Fund. Um, and I am so excited today to uh, be joined by Anna here. So, Anna, would you uh, please just introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Anna Keller. I am the executive director of the League of Women Voters of Maine and Maine Citizens for Clean Elections, um, two organizations that are working to make our democracy work better here in Maine and everyone have a, have a say in government. Wonderful. Um, and uh, I so appreciate the work that you do. Um, and I really always enjoy working uh, with League of Women Voters um, and uh, just Democracy Maine as a whole. But would you be able to talk a little bit about um, the work that you do in Maine? Yeah, so um, we work on making it easier for people to get involved in their government and have a say in the decisions that are impacting them in their lives. And so that goes all the way from making sure that everyone is able to vote. Um, we do a lot of work around voter registration and helping people get to the polls and understand the issues on their ballot, um, all the way through changing legislation that makes it easier for people to participate. So working on voting rights, um, systems about how we vote. Um, we've worked on ranked choice voting and changing um, our voting system to make it um, people have better choices and um, improving the system in that way. And we spend a lot of time working on the issues around big money in politics because that distorts our democracy. It distorts who is able to have a voice, the kinds of people that are able to get elected and the kind of representation that we're able to have. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and uh, well, I'm really excited to dig into this conversation. Really, the only reason that we're having this session is because um, we received some really great questions about money and politics from our Google form, from our, from our virtual Girls Day participants. Um, and I think they're all really excited about this. So um, what are some of the ways that big money um, makes an impact on Maine's political system? And, and uh, how, are you, how do you work to try and counter that influence? Yeah, so we're really lucky in Maine as a start because for the last 20 years or more, we've had a system called clean elections. And that means that candidates can run for office at the state level without needing to raise huge amounts of money um, to get money from lobbyists or corporations. Um, how that works is that they collect small donations from the voters in their district. Um, and then those small donations, $5, per voter, um, help them qualify for public funding. They get money from the state government that they can then use to run their campaign. And so it means that you don't have to be wealthy. You can be, you know, an, really or, an ordinary person who has good ideas and is willing to work hard and connect with your voters. And then you're on an equal playing field with other candidates. Um, you have the money that it takes to get your message out. And there's restrictions. You can only spend that money on really election related things. If you don't spend it, you have to give it back at the end of the election. Um, but because we have that clean elections program, um, candidates can run who otherwise might be um, deterred from getting involved in the first place because they are afraid that they won't be able to raise the money. They don't like the idea of asking people for lots of money um, to run their campaign. And then the voters have more confidence that those people are gonna be able to represent them and not the people who wrote the checks because it's just their everyday voters who gave them $5. That's not giving them um, influence or corruption. That's, um, that's much more how representation is supposed to work. So we've got this one really good thing going for us. Maine is the first state to have a system like this and it's still, um, unfortunately, there's only a few states that have a kind of public funding program like Maine Clean Elections. We've had to fight to keep it. Um, I first got involved in this work on a campaign to strengthen the system, um, helping volunteers get organized to collect signatures for a citizen initiative to strengthen our clean elections program. But even though that helps people be able to run and get involved, there are still other issues around money and politics. One big problem is that um, this system doesn't um, apply at the federal level. So president, US Congress, US Senate, 
they don't have any option other than to raise um, all of this huge sums of money to be able to run for office and take money it, from corporations and wealthy people. Because it costs a lot of money to run for office. There's a lot of things that you need, and especially if you're hiring staff and printing out materials. Um, so I think it's it's really incredible that that Maine does have this system where you know even if it's if it's just you know the local level, I, I think that. In, in a lot of ways, it's so great that the, the representatives that are often closest to the communities that they serve, you know, who just have a, a, a district as opposed to, say, you know, half the state or the entire state, um, really are going to be represented. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and so, you know, it, it does take a lot of money, of course, to, to run for office. And I'm sure we've, we've seen that the, the uh, you know, recent presidential elections, I mean, just astronomical sums of money um, are needed. And so, you know, if you, it's, for a lot of folks, it's easier to ask one very, very well off person for, you know, one donation than it is to ask a thousand folks for a smaller donation. Um, but then, of course, that person who's writing all those big checks might have a little bit of an outsized say in the platform of the candidate that they're choosing to support. Um, yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate the work that you do um, in, in terms of the, um, the electoral process, um, but we also got some great questions about um, the legislative process. Um, so once people are already in office um, and we're trying to get bills passed, and so um, one of the first questions, um, and this is probably like the question that really made me think like this is going to be a great session is, is it true that corporations use money to get bills passed? Yes, it is. Um, and they use their money in a couple of different ways. Um, like we were talking about, they try to use their money to determine who gets into office in the first place. Um, but then once those um, elected officials, they are in office, um, there's a couple things that corporations do. The biggest one is they hire lobbyists. Either they have someone who works for their company who goes and lobbies, or they hire a professional lobbyist to do it on their behalf. And so then they have someone who is in the state capitol all the time talking to legislators. Um, they know all of what's going on um, and they have that kind of constant presence that most ordinary citizens or a small business wouldn't have the ability to be there in front of the legislature all the time. So that can be really powerful with those lobbyists. Um, the other thing that they can do is try to shape public opinion about an issue. So sometimes you'll see corporations spend money on political ads. Um, they'll send the mail pieces to voters. They'll um, put ads on TV and they'll try to shape how the public thinks about an issue as well, because they know that that way, even for the legislators that are paying as much attention to their their voters as to the lobbyists and to the people who are giving them the campaign contributions, they're trying to change the way the voters think as well. And while there's a lot of um, rules about how lobbyists can operate, there's rules about how corporations can give to candidates, um, there aren't restrictions on the kind of advertising that they can do directly to the public. And so that's a really big way that they can have um, influence um, on what everyday people think about their issues as well. Absolutely. And, um, you know, uh, that, that was another question we got about, you know, what role advertising plays in the government. And, and I do think that sort of our whole media system can be this big kind of dump of money. Um, and a lot of the times, even, um, you know, when it's just during an election, uh, I think another thing that, that maybe some folks don't always realize um, is, is that uh, it's not always the candidates who are running these ads. It can be a bunch of people who get a bunch of money together so that they can run ads on behalf of the candidate, but they're not actually mm -hmm. coordinating. And so it's, there's sort of this break in, in accountability sometimes um, because the candidate, you know, they could get the benefit of this advertising, but when it comes down to it, they're like, I'm not actually with these people. Um, was there anything that, that, that you wanted to add kind of on that or maybe the, the topic of, you know, super PACs and such? So mm -hmm. that's, a, <laughs> that's a whole big thing. Yeah. I mean, and when you hear people talk about um, Citizens United and about the Supreme Court and all of the um, ways that money in politics, which has always been a problem as 
longer than America has been a country, people have been worrying about the influence of money in politics. Yeah. Um, but it's particularly gotten bad in the last um, 10 years because of some decisions that were made at the US Supreme Court that said that um, there isn't, um, it's not a, possible to regulate what corporations are spending um, on ads um, that are not directly, you know, endorsing a candidate. So if they're not out there saying, go vote for Joe Smith, he's great, they can be saying, you know, did you know that certain candidates um, are terrible for the environment and they're terrible and they hate puppies and, you know, we just wanted you to know that. <laughs> they can go out and say all of those things without any, you know, <laughs> um, and they can spend as much money as they want on that. Um, mm -hmm. and, you know, and Joe Smith might have wanted them to do it. He might not have wanted them to do it, but they're wow. out there doing what the corporation wants and we're not allowed to regulate what, how they do that, which is a big difference from how other countries deal with this issue. Um, because, you know, political advertising in and of itself, is not necessarily a bad thing. You want candidates to be able to get their message out. You know, if you want to talk about an issue and have people understand more about it. I mean, what kind of what you're doing is advertising. What matters is who gets to have their voice out there? How much does it cost? Um, are people allowed to, you know, to lie without any fact checking? Do we know where, who is talking and where their money is coming from? It's all of those issues that start to get into why it can be a problem. So in some other countries, they will say the only people who are allowed to um, write, to do TV advertisements six weeks be before an election are the candidate or the party itself and all candidates get an equal amount of time on TV to get, give their message wow. um, and that's it. You, you know, you get an equal amount of time, nobody gets more than that. It's only in a short period before the election. And so they are regulating what people are allowed to say, but it means that um, a smaller party could have um, a chance to get their message out, even if they don't have as much um, money as uh, a party that has, you know, that's more established. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think another really um, big difference in the United States um, was something that you touched on really briefly that I'm wondering if we could go into a bit more detail on was is um, Citizens United. And what is that? Um, yeah, so that was a case in the Supreme Court in um, 2010 that said that um, corporations can spend um, money on these independent advertisements as much as they want. Um, you're not allowed to regulate what they say because in this case, money is the equivalent it's the same thing as speech. And so we have freedom of speech in the US. A corporation has the same rights as a person to free speech and their money that they spend on something equals speech. And so that argument, sometimes you'll hear people say, you know, corporations aren't people, money isn't speech. It's yeah. all referring back to this Supreme Court decision that was giving corporations the same rights as people to have this free political speech. And you, what you have to, in order to argue with that, you know, you have to say, well, yes, we have freedom of speech, but there are places where that's restricted because we also have other rights. Mm. Um, and so sometimes you, the government will decide to put some restrictions on one right in certain cases because they're protecting other rights. And so we could say that our votes being equal the one person, one vote principle um, and political equality and the ability to prevent corruption, all of those are really important rights and things that the government is trying to protect for us. Um, but they might need to put some limits on the kinds of political speech uh, or the amount of money that could be spent on certain kinds of speech in order to preserve that political equality and our votes you know, being equal. Um, the Supreme Court has not 
let that argument stand. They're saying, nope, there are no limits on free speech for corporations in political spending. We don't think the value of making sure that citizens have an equal voice in a democracy, that's not um, a good enough reason to um, limit what corporations say. Lots of people, many lawyers, um, and lots of people with common sense disagree with that, but that's mm -hmm. where the Supreme Court is right now. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it is, I mean, um, you know, if you follow the analogy of, you know, money counts as speech, it's like, well, yes, you know, these two people do have equal, uh, equal right, they can both say whatever they want. Um, it's just that this one person is just saying in a conversation, and this other person is saying it, and that's also being played on, you know, 20,000 TVs across the state, but they're both equal. But of course, you know, it, it, you know, really what you, you know, that, that other person is, is not really getting the same opportunity. Um, they just sort of don't have nearly as many opportunities to make that message heard. Um, so it's, that's really interesting. Um, another question that we got, um, and we did, we did actually have a whole session on lobbyists um, about, uh, but, um, you know, I think that one of the places that this gets complicated, because of course, you know, on the one hand, we're talking about corporations can hire lobbyists, which are folks who hang out in, in the state house and can make those, those personal connections. Um, but then on the other hand, you know, uh, like I'm, you know, wearing my main women's lobby t-shirt and the main women's lobby, like we have lobbyists. So it gets a little bit complicated because sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you have a lobbyist who is do, who is trying to represent a, a group of people that they think are, uh, do not kind of have that same voice. Um, so it can get kind of complicated because, you know, uh, you know, uh, my organization does rely on, on money from, from folks and, and we ask for donors and we also get grants and such, but for lobbying work specifically, there are a lot of rules mm -hmm. around whether or not, uh, or, it, you know, corporations can hire their own yeah. lobbyists, but in terms of uh, folks donating, say, to us, um, there it's, you know, a whole different tax situation <laughs> um, when they're donating yeah. for our lobbying work. Um, so it's it's very interesting. And, uh, you know, do you, did you have anything to comment on in terms of, you know, mm -hmm. on the one hand, money definitely um, can create a negative outsized influence, but on the other hand, at least as of 2020, it's also a pretty essential thing for folks who want to do good work. Yeah, and I, so I, I am a registered lobbyist. I am paid by my organization to do lobbying on behalf of the issues that our members care about. Um, and so sometimes I end up lobbying to restrict the power of lobbyists, which is fun. <laughs> I also raise money in order to get money out of politics. I mean, these are the hypocrisies of the world yeah. that we're in. That's where um, <clears throat> But, you know, it's the same thing as I was saying about advertising, which is that lobbying in and of itself, not a bad thing because most people don't have the time and access to go spend a lot of time in Augusta. And while I think that we should make um, public hearings be much more accessible, there should be ways for the legislature to meet and take comments um, at different times of day and mm -hmm. make it easier for people to be there, make the rules a lot clearer. Um, there should be a lot of ways that make it easier for everyday people to have their say. Mm -hmm. Even so, um, people should have the right to come together and say, we want to pool our resources and get someone there to represent us um, when we all can't be there ourselves and to bring our voice and make sure that what we're saying is heard when we can't be there ourselves. I think that's mm -hmm. really a valid thing. Um, what ends up being difficult with that is when one of those lobbyists um, also comes from an organization that is making campaign contributions. And so they end up having um, extra weight behind their words because they are not only speaking on behalf of a group of interested people, they're speaking on behalf of a group of political donors. And <laughs> So their words carry more weight than someone who's speaking on behalf of a group of people 
aren't, who don't have those resources and don't have that kind of power. Um, the other issue that can come up is that sometimes legislators, they like, you know, they're busy, they're stressed, they are only there for four, um, for eight years at a time if, you know, if they're mm -hmm. lucky because we've got term limits. And so they can end up depending on certain lobbyists to tell them, you know, what's going on and what the truth is. And so lobbyists, just by virtue of being there and having the time um, to learn about issues and to build those relationships, can end up having a lot of influence over legislators. Someone who's just come in, this isn't the issue that they know a lot about, mm -hmm. um, can find it really easy to yeah. lean heavily on what a lobbyist is telling them. Um, yeah. So, you know, when, when that means that they trust what I'm telling them, I don't want to be too mad, but it is something that you have, we have to find ways to, um, to counter that so that um, a few lobbyists who have 30 years of experience don't end up having more power than the elected representatives. Absolutely. And that's, I think that's a really incredible way of putting it because, I mean, eight years is actually not that long of a time to really get uh, seasoned in how everything works and, you know, who the people are to talk to and, and what you know. Um, and, uh, but, but a lobbyist can, you know, can spend their entire career kind of learning how that system works. And I think that that can also be a valuable thing. I mean, I'm really, I, uh, I myself often lean on the expertise of lobbyists because they have such a detailed understanding of not only how the legislative process works on paper, but how the legislative process works as something that a lot of people are actually doing. Um, and, and people always say, you know, politics is about people. Um, but uh, I don't think I even quite realized that until I started working um, you know, at, at Maine Women's Lobby, where we were doing more inside the state house, I was doing more kind of outside the state house community organizing. But it's sometimes literally as simple as you're just at the state house enough, and you just some you just kind of get to know people. Like, oh hey, how are you doing? What's going on today? And then like, what do you think about this bill? And it's it, it's really um, interesting how personal of a process that can be. Um, and so you know, uh, you know, it's. And so that can be an asset and that can be a really valuable support system, especially um, if you're coming from an area of, of expertise. Like I, I know that our executive director, um, Desti, she did a lot of work um, in the sexual assault field and so had this really detailed knowledge of a very, um, you know, complicated area of the law. Um, and that's a really important resource for legislators to have. But, you know, while legislators are so busy, it's sometimes, you know, it's this extra thing to do to figure out exactly who should be trustworthy and, and what the motivations of all those people are. Yeah, it's really true. And one of the things that's kind of funny about the, the issue, the area that I work on with election laws and campaign finance and all of these <laughs> things is that all of the legislators that I talk to they've won at least one election, which means that they think that they are experts about elections and campaigns. Yeah. They, and they're also thinking directly, how is this change you're proposing going to affect me and my reelection? Um, mm -hmm. So they have this sort of personal stake in it that they might not have if I was talking to a legislator about lobster fishing or about sexual assault or right. any other issue that they, you know, they might recognize that they don't know as much about. They feel like um, with elections, like I've won one, the rules must work. Yeah. They got me here. Um, qualified, so. <laughs> yeah. So it's sort of a funny conversation that we have with some legislators. Um, and particularly when you talk to them about corruption and you say, you know, oh, lobbyists and corporations have too much influence. They go, are you saying that I'm corrupt? I've never been influenced by a lobbyist in my life. And we're saying, even if that were true, what about the other people? And also, don't you want your constituents, your voters to believe that you're not being influenced? Because you might be totally clean. You might have never had a, a thought that was influenced by a lobbyist ever. But your voters don't think that that's what's going on. Wouldn't you want to build their trust? But we have these really funny conversations with legislators because they take it really personally. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, it's it's so interesting how kind of the issue is so tied into the, the specific process. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, 
you know, that's, that's uh, I think, another issue around money in politics is transparency as well. Um, because, you know, you can say kind of whatever you want, but I think that we get into some problems when there are organizations that are allowed to take a gigantic amount of money um, from people and not necessarily disclose where that money is coming from because it's all going into this organization and then it's the organization that makes the donation to uh, to the to the candidate um, and the organization will often have kind of a, a vague name <laughs> like this person for America um, and then it's like here is you know w- you know 500 million dollars um, <laughs> do you have anything that you wanted to talk about about that issue of transparency Yeah, it's really important in terms of understanding who's behind information. Um, And it can be really difficult right now because of the way um, you can have layers and layers and layers of organizations um, that are behind um, different groups. Um, One of the things that Democracy Maine and the League is working on is a... um, ban on corporate contributions to candidates and their um, the political action committees that legislators control. Um, and we know that this is going to be something that we have needed for a long time. A lot of other states actually have a ban on corporations making direct contributions to candidates, oh. but Maine doesn't. Um, oh. And because Maine has so many candidates who use clean elections where they can't take money from corporations um it's not as big a problem here as it is in some places but there's still 40 percent of candidates that don't use clean elections so they're still being influenced and there are um candidates can have their own political action committees if they're running for a leadership position in the legislature um or they have higher political ambition and those um PACs can take in unlimited corporate money right now Mm -hmm. And so we want to work on eliminating that in the next legislative session. And in order to figure that out, we wanted to do some research and see, well, what industries and which corporations are giving the most money to candidates? So we went back through all of the campaign finance reports, which are available, Mm -hmm. but then trying to figure out, okay, is this um, organization of um, real estate professionals but where's the money coming from behind that is it really Mm -hmm. just coming from one developer you know or Mm -hmm. looking at um some of these other industry groups trying to figure out okay but where is the money coming from behind that are they also spending money on lobbyists which bills were they lobbying on which legislators were on those committees you're starting to try to unravel this because it's not you know, it's not, hey, we gave you money and now you're going to vote on this bill the way we want to. That would be literal corruption and that is illegal. Yeah. It's much more subtle influence than that. Mm-hmm. And so you have to try to piece together this story. And by doing that, we can see that there are some industries that spend a lot of money on campaign contribution and a lot of money on lobbyists. And there are industries that are involved in some of the most hotly contested issues like healthcare or energy. Um, And they're um, spending huge amounts of money on um, campaign contributions and on lobbyists. Mm -hmm. Um, And one other question, and this one might be a little bit esoteric, um, but I think that a a huge change that we've had in in our political system over the past couple of decades, and it's something that our students will be much more familiar with than than probably even me, is the internet. Um, and, And I think that the internet has, in some ways, offered a platform for voices to be heard in a way that can sometimes appear more democratic or or you can you know if you have a message that goes viral and you don't you don't necessarily have to pay for it it's just people are sharing it because that idea resonates with them um and but then on the flip side um the internet has probably fewer protections on it than say tv advertising in terms of what you can and can't say um i know especially facebook for example does almost all of their ad vetting um via an algorithm and so usually there's almost no real person who actually is taking a look at that content and so you sometimes see stuff on the internet and you're like well that is an outlandish claim about a person um 
but I have no idea if it's true. Um, do you have any, any thoughts about kind of how the internet has, has impacted our political system and whether it's been for good or bad or like money in general for both? Yeah, I mean, I think overall it's a tool and it can be a really powerful tool for people who don't have, you know, who don't have power in other ways. Like we have seen ways in which really good organizing and communication and connection can happen on the internet that, and it also lets us see what's happening around the world. Like we think about protest movements where people have learned in Ferguson from what was going on in the Arab Spring and people mm -hmm. look at different um, movements going on around the world that can be really inspired by each other. Um, and at the same time, um, <clears throat> I think the speed of information that we get and the um, sort of deluge of opinions can mm -hmm. also make people have too much information. And that can really be a problem. People are like, I see radical things being said um, by people on every side. I feel like my only choices are to get really mad and jump in or to completely tune it out and not pay attention. Mm -hmm. And it's harder to have um, really to sort through what's true, to sort through what kinds of action can be meaningful. And so um, it's why I think it's important for people to get um, involved with other people in their work and find people on the internet <laughs> or in person <laughs> that you can that you can trust um, or an organization that you can trust and um, use that as a way to help you filter the information that you're getting into um, ways that you can take action and build community out of it. Um, so one of the things that I think can be really powerful is um, having um, an organization or a group that you're with um, that you can say, you know what, I really need to take a break from looking at the news, but I'm going to trust that my friend this week is going to follow this story and tell me when the time to take action is. And yeah. then on another week or on another issue, I'll tune in on that so that we can all feel like um, we can um, be engaged without having to know everything. And that's, of course, not even touching any of the issues that we've seen around um, disinformation campaigns that are intentional, um, mm -hmm. like the um, money that Russia spent on influencing um, the last election that's being spent on influencing this election by spreading um, rumors and trying to increase that division. Mm -hmm. um, but, and that's a, that's a huge problem, um, but it basically comes down to um, trying to find some sources that you can trust um, and engage deeper with those sources rather than um, look at the deluge of information on the internet and mm -hmm. then feeling like, um, I don't know where to start. Maybe I can't trust anything. It's yeah. important to find a few sources that you can trust and try to engage with them. Absolutely. Um, and while the internet has, has brought on so many new facets and new complications into our political system, in a lot of ways, it's, it's um, just a, uh, really the same old story. It's, it's money being used to give somebody an outsized voice when uh, 100 years ago it would be a big sign and 20 years ago it was a TV ad. Now it might be a bunch of Twitter bots that are just making, you know, inflammatory comments um, and or even you know, sometimes it seems like the aim is just to like confuse people um, and, and or make them feel uneasy or, or elicit a strong emotional response and not even kind of going into facts that I, I do really agree. Um, and, and I'm lucky that I have so many, I mean, obviously all the community organizers in, in Maine, we all are like Facebook friends and such. And so mm -hmm. um, there, there are folks that, um, you know, I do really trust. And, and so when they're saying, hey, this is an important action to take, I, it's, it, I've, because I've already built up relationships with that person and because I, I know that they're from an organization that I can trust, I can say, you know what, that sounds good. It sounds like I'm going to sign this petition and I can sign this petition because this person that I trust said that it's really important and I trust them to have all of their facts straight because if I needed to get every single fact on every single issue that might require my attention or every movement that I can be a meaningful contributor to, um, you know, my head might explode. There's just, there's just too much of it. 
Um, well, thank you so much. This has been such a fascinating conversation. Um, do you mind telling folks where they might be able to find um, more of your organization, if you have a website or a Facebook? Yeah, yeah we do. Um, so you can go to democracymaine.org to learn more about both of our organizations. And if you want to dig in more on the all of the money and politics pieces, um, maincleanelections.org is the website for our um, that goes into our money and politics work. Um, we are on Twitter, we're on Facebook, we're on Instagram. Um, I've heard a rumor that we're getting a TikTok soon, which I'm kind of excited about, but um, I'm not sure what we're going to do with a money in politics TikTok, but we're going to figure out something. Um, I barely but we know are, what TikTok um, is. Like, can't we use Vine instead? Like, I'm <laughs> <laughs> um, but we're on all of those platforms. You can find us um, with Main Clean Main Citizens for Clean Elections or Main Clean Elections, both will get you to where you uh, where you want to go. And yeah, and we would love to um, engage more with anybody who wants to learn or take action on these issues. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate you coming here today.